Well, hello there. I'm Brian Goulet of GouletPens.com, and this is the 55th episode of Goulet Q&A on October 30th of 2014. Now, October 30th, 2014, that's a Thursday. Why in the world am I releasing a Q&A video on a Thursday? Normally I do them on Friday. That's very odd. Well, I have something really special coming out tomorrow. Big announcement huge announcement and i thought that it warranted its own day so i actually moved the q a off of friday and i'm doing it early so that i can give you a heads up about that announcement that's coming out on the 31st which actually just happens to be halloween my announcement has nothing to do with halloween but it's coming so be sure to look out on the blog youtube and whatnot for a big announcement then Anyway, so I'm doing Q&A a day early, so that's cool. Right now it's actually Wednesday as I'm filming this, so kind of threw my schedule in the loop a little bit, but that's okay, you know, because uh, I'm flexible here. See in the background there? That's, you know, be flexible. That's part of our company values here. So uh, anyway, got a lot of cool stuff that's going on. Um, you know, we've been alluding to some pretty cool stuff that we've been working on. Some of that's product related, some of it's not. I will reveal more of that tomorrow, but anyway. Got all kinds of cool products that have been coming out in the last week or so. You know, a lot of manufacturers, what they do in the pen world is they kind of wait until like the, the pre-holiday season and they start releasing pens and stuff because everybody's kind of building up and getting excited. And it's, you know, it's a big time for just retail in general. But uh, it's definitely true as of notice over the last five years. In the pen world, a bunch of people start coming out with stuff October, November, December. Um, so we got some new stuff that's coming in. Um, stuff that we've just recently announced. Um, first off, I've been talking for a little bit about the Omas Ojiva Alba. This is a pen that we'll have um, exclusively in the U.S. here at Goulet. Um, it'll be available elsewhere worldwide, but um, it's uh, one of the least expensive Omas pens that have ever come out. Piston fill demonstrator, 18 karat nib, also has a 14 karat flexible nib option. Really cool pen. I will be talking more about that soon, but that one is coming. It's not available yet, but stuff that we have now that is available the Stipula Splash just came out. It's a neat little pen. It's got a steel flex nib. So that's kind of neat because uh, Noodlers has kind of had the lock on the steel flex nibs for a while. Um, and this one is, uh, it's a list price is 79. We got it for 64. So it's a nice little, nice little uh, pen there. So I'll be talking more about that one as well. Lamy has um, come out with a gift set which is really kind of cool. They came out with them very late last year, very small quantities. So you may remember hearing something about them. Basically, they have a, a selection of All Stars and Safaris that are only coming in a medium nib. So there's that, but um, it's got a bottle of ink, set of cartridges and a converter in a nice little gift box here. Perfect for gift giving, that kind of thing. Um, so that is coming. Um, and then we also just got, we didn't give you any heads up about this, but um, the Delta Unica. It's a model that's been out for a few months here. We haven't carried it at Goulet, um, but uh, we were kind of waiting for this one. So basically it's a um, Delta pen that is under $100, which is pretty cool in and of itself, um, but it's made with the same orange celluloid that you see in the Dolce Vita, which is a multi hundred dollar pen um, and also it's got gold trim but it's got a brushed gold uh, nib it's a stainless steel nib but it's a brushed gold finish on that stainless steel nib in fine medium and broad and celluloid for under 100 bucks it's pretty exciting comes with it comes with a uh, converter it's the uh, little bit little bit smaller converter it's a standard international it's a little bit smaller than the, the normal ones it's the same converter i think that's used on the uh, uh, like Monteverde Artista Crystal, if you're familiar with that. So um, really exciting pen. Just that is really cool. So we've just got all kinds of awesome stuff coming. And there's more. There's a lot more coming. I, I kind of alluded previously that like there's a lot of stuff in the works. And boy, it is really coming on thick. So that's super exciting. The, the pen nerd in me is just like, oh, yeah, give it to me. You know, and there's just there's just cool stuff, you know, neat kind of things. Just not your typical kind of, you know, you know, plastic pen with a medium nib kind of thing. So just lots of neat stuff. I'm just, I'm really excited about that. Um, just kind of on the personal side is cover, you know, Rachel and I have been working like dogs, you know, everybody been working around here, um, you know, on this secret thing that we'll allude to tomorrow. 
Um, but, uh, you know, we did take last weekend, visited Rachel's family, um, and uh, her family's from the Northern Virginia area. And for those of you who are from that kind of Northern Virginia, D.C. area, um, there's this thing called Cox Farms, which is basically like, you know, they've got hay rides and fresh apple cider and pumpkin patch and corn mazes and all that kind of stuff. We took our two young kids there and they had an absolute blast. They're just like a great age for that kind of stuff. They really had a good time. And it was just kind of nice because like Rachel and I, we work really hard. You know, who doesn't? But like, seriously, we, we give up a lot to do what we do. And, and it was just really nice to like do something just really out of the ordinary like that. Um, a really family thing, taking pictures and videos and stuff. And it's just, you know, that's the kind of stuff you'll remember like years from now with your kids. So that was just really great to be able to do that. Um, and then also, you know, we started Financial Peace. For those of you who are familiar with Dave Ramsey, he's got a, a course called Financial Peace. Um, basically, it's a kind of a money management course. Um, and we offered it last year for our team. Um, and we're doing it again this year. Year. So we've hired a lot of people in the last year or so. Um, I mentioned last week that we were starting that up. Um, we've finished up the second week of it, of the nine-week course, and it's going really well. You know, it's just, it's really cool to be able to, to kind of offer that for me and Rachel to get to know, you know, some of the newer folks on our team a little bit better and get to meet some of their significant others and so on. And, and it's just really kind of neat. So that's kind of what we've been up to. But anyway, we've got a whole bunch of questions. Um, I got way more questions than I can answer. Last week, I just really talked a lot. And, uh, you know, especially that last question on the q and I know I kind of, you know, rubbed a couple people the wrong way. And, you know, I'm not going to over apologize for it. I feel like I apologize enough in the comments, but like, and we were out of town on Friday when it published and everything. And I was like trying to, you know, I just, you know, as I went back and watched the video, I was like, man, I really kind of just didn't come across quite the way that I was thinking in my head that I would. And I really kind of just talked talk too deeply into something I really didn't need to go into. Um, but anyway, so, you know, it's just the kind of thing, like I shoot these videos and especially the Q and A's, like I really don't go back and review them. So it's kind of a one shot deal. You're, you're really getting like, you know, the raw take of what I'm doing. So, you know, it just kind of is what it is. So, you know, I, I, I was exploring kind of a, an aspect of, you know, an aspect of, uh, of um, kind of a personality style that I don't typically go into. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of my limit there. That's kind of, I'm not gonna get too deep into that kind of thing. So I'm gonna pull back, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, gonna be just a little more, you know, cautious, I guess. I don't know. I'm again, I'm speaking too deeply on the whole thing, but um, you know, just want to kind of apologize to anybody who watched that last week that maybe thought I came across, you know, in a, in a, in a wrong way. So I'm really sorry about that. I, I genuinely am. But um, live and learn. You know, I've shot a lot of these videos and, and I'm going to keep doing them as authentically as I can. Um, so I'll kick it off here with an email that I have from Tom J. Um, he says, uh, the answer to this can be your guesstimate. I don't need hard data, but what percentage of customers uh, who buy a product take the time to leave a review of that product? I'm guessing it's less than 10%, but maybe not. These product reviews are so important to me. They've sold me on more items than not, and I devour them whenever I'm interested in a product. But it seems like there should be more reviews of popular items than there are. Thanks. Well, thank you, Tom. That's something interesting that not a lot of people have asked about before. Um, you know, when our, when our store was much younger, you know, we have a lot of different products, and you know, when you don't have a lot of reviews on your site, you know, that's something that you don't really know. And I've, I've read, you know, I'm a business guy and I've read a lot of different things about product reviews and all that. And I think generally speaking, product reviews are a pretty trusted source of information. I don't think it's just you, Tom. I think a lot of people generally, you are, you are inclined to trust product reviews as long as they're not too heavily moderated and they're not all, you know, if you've got hundreds and hundreds of five stars, then maybe you'll have to kind of look at that. And I know we, we actually have a lot of like very highly rated stuff on our site. We're not like moderating really pretty much anything on our site. I mean, we, um, we have moderated certain things here and there. Like if somebody says like, well, I've never used this pen, but it seems like it's terrible. And they give it one star. I'm like, okay, that's not like a, a real kind of legitimate review. Um, or if they're just like having profanity and like that kind of stuff. Um, but, but generally speaking, we don't monitor, you know, too much of that at all. Um, but, uh, that said, we've got 
got we've got a lot of reviews on our site now, like a lot of them, and I'm actually really thrilled to see that because I hold a lot of value in that. Uh, and you know, me personally, um, you know, just as a reviewer, as somebody who's just kind of interested in that stuff myself, especially when I see like some of the popular products that have you know hundred or more reviews, that's just really cool. Because then it's like, all right, if you got a hundred different reviews, you know that that's that's pretty legit. Um, but uh, you know, as far as a percentage goes, I can't really give you a percentage. Um, you know, I would say, yeah, less than 10%, I'm sure, is, is, is pretty safe guess. Um, it also has to do with, you know, the functionality and like the way you leave reviews and stuff like that. We've got kind of a quirky thing on our site right now where, you know, if you leave a review, like if you buy, you know, 50 different products, like if you're, especially if you're stocking up on ink samples or like a lot of really, really low cost things, it's, it's easy to get a whole lot of different products. We got this thing on our site right now where you can't leave a review, you know, in the automated email that we send out in... Uh, just for just one product. You got to do a review for every single thing. So I know that cuts down a lot on, on you know, people's willingness to leave review. Um, you know, you, of course you can go onto their site and you can leave an, an individual review. Um, but, you know, we do send out an, an automated email and, and that kind of gets to the second part of your question. You know, it seems like there should be more reviews of popular items than there are. Um, a lot of that has to do, you know, popular items um, it could vary, like especially if it's a new if it's a new product, um, if it's something that hasn't been released yet. You know, how would there be reviews? But if it's something that's pretty new, like within the last three four weeks, um, the reason there's not a lot of reviews on it is because we we do send out an email, um, and it's it's usually about three weeks after you've purchased whatever you know you placed your order and the reason we do that is because if we send it out too soon you wouldn't have you know there's like obviously like shipping time and stuff like that you know if we send it out three days afterwards you know if you're on the other side of the country from us you you probably are just getting your stuff by then and you wouldn't have had time to play with it and really get to know it so we want to leave adequate time for you to be able to get your pen or your ink or whatever have time to use it a little bit and then you know, we send you a notice like, hey, you know, it'd be cool if you left a review, you've actually used it by that point. So when you're seeing a new product like, you know, Jerobon Stormy Gray right now, like that's a fairly new product. And you would think like it's blowing up on the internet, everybody's talking about it, but there's not a lot of reviews. That's because a lot of the um, prompts haven't gone out yet to leave those reviews. Like that's obviously a huge deal. You know, people, people, you know, when you buy it, you don't think on your own to just go back. Oh yeah, let me go back to the website where I purchased this thing and go leave a review. If you do, that's awesome. And we super appreciate that. But you know, it helps to get an email prompt. You know, that's why we do that. Um, so that, that's kind of it for other things. You know, definitely there's some products where I'm like, I don't know why there aren't a lot of reviews. There just aren't, um, but yeah. That's pretty much that's pretty much what's going on there, Tom. All right, Eileen Z on Facebook. What would you recommend for a fountain pen to be used as a highlighter for students? And what highlighter ink would you recommend? Um, well, there's a couple of different options. I've spoken about highlighters like a while back. I don't even remember when. It might have been in a Q and A like last year sometime. But whatever. I thought it was I thought it was pretty you know interesting. I just you know wanted to include it. So. Um, there's a couple different options. As far as an actual fountain pen, um, you, the, the thing that I recommend usually is the, um, the Pilot Parallel. Uh, and the reason I like that is because it's pretty inexpensive and it's got you know, lots of varying sizes of very wide nibs. You know, a typical fountain pen, it's gonna leave you a, f a finer line than what you would want in a highlighter. You, know, you want something that's a millimeter and a half, two millimeters, four millimeters even, you know, depending on the text that you're dealing with. Um, so you want something that's pretty fat and that's where the parallels really come in. They, the biggest one they have is a six millimeter, it's pretty huge. Um, so you've got that option there. Um, the nice thing about using the, a pen like that with a really fat kind of italic like nib um, is as opposed to you know your typical like felt tip highlighter is those metal tips are gonna hold up a lot longer. You can clean them out easier. They're not gonna clog like those felt tips will. And so you'll be able to use them for a long period of time and you can switch it up with whatever kind of ink you want pretty easily. The alternative would be something like the Platinum Preppy Highlighter or the Preppy Marker. Those are even more, even less expensive um, than you would get with something like a Parallel, but that's more of your kind of typical felt tip, you know, chisel tip kind of thing, like you would typically buy with a disposable, you know, highlighter like this. 
Um, so if you, that's a good refillable highlighter option. You know, you can either fill up the pen, like convert it as an eyedropper and fill it up with an ink. You can get highlighter cartridges, you know, from platinum. Um, and, uh, or you can, um, you know, get a converter, like a platinum converter and use it. The platinum converter will cost more than the highlighter <laughs> or the marker pen will. Uh, but you can do that for sure. Um, it's a little easier to clean and kind of use it like that. But I don't know how often you're actually changing the inks in your highlighter. Maybe you do. I don't know. It's probably cheap enough where you could just buy multiple highlighters and, you know, so on. Um, but uh, as far as inks go, um, my favorite tends to be Noodler's Firefly. I like that one the most. Um, the Noodler's Dragon Cats are pretty decent too. You know, Pelican's got a, a couple highlighter inks. Um, Private Reserve has a, the Chartreuse highlighter. Um, they're all they're all fairly similar, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Um, Noodler's has Year of the Golden Pig. That one is uh, bulletproof, and so is the um, uh, Dragon Cats. So, you know, it really kind of depends on what color you're going for. There's not this huge selection of fountain pen highlighter inks out there, but there are a few to choose from. All right, Brandon D. on Facebook said, I know you said you don't go to many pen shows, but coming up on my one year anniversary of getting my first fountain pen, and it's also my 21st birthday, happy birthday, uh, I was hoping to go to the Columbus Pen Show on November 8th. My question, is it worth it to go even if I'm not able to purchase anything, or should I set aside $150 or so to take with me? I currently live two hours away and don't know if I should use the gas. Yeah, well, you know, two hour drive, that's a decent little drive. Gas prices are coming down a little bit, so maybe that helps to lighten your budget a little bit. I don't know, but, um, you know, for me, I've, I've actually never been to the Columbus Pen Show. I hear it's a pretty good one. Uh, my buddy Brian Gray from Edison Pens, he is right near there, so I know he's gonna be there. Um, so, but the Columbus Show, I hear, is a pretty decent show. So as far as pen shows go, that's probably a, not a bad one for you to wanna go to. You know, being two hours away, it's definitely a bit of a haul, but that is certainly within a day's drive. You don't have to worry about hotel or anything like that. Um, so, you know, I think it would be kind of cool for you to go. Personally, you know, pen shows for me are not like my deal, you know, but I always go to the DC show every year. Um, I, I've never been to any other show besides the DC pen show. So it's hard for me to say like all the different shows and the whole, the whole show circuit scene. I know there's definitely like um, a loyal group of people that kind of like go to the, the different shows and stuff. And that's, that's totally cool. It is definitely a very different experience than it is shopping online. You know, you get to see a whole bunch of things, hold a bunch of pens. Um, you get to talk to people who are kind of in the industry, especially if you are familiar with some of the Nibmeisters and some of the other, you know, manufacturers and stuff like that. They'll have booths at the show. You can actually talk to people like Brian Gray and some of those other folks that set up, set up booths at the show. So it is really kind of cool in that respect. You know, as far as going just for a shopping experience, um, you know, you'll have to kind of weigh that out. You know, there's some people that try to like cut deals and stuff at the show and you might be able to get that, but you know, with the cost of gas and all those other things, I don't know if that alone is enough of a reason to go. Um, it would mainly be if you're trying to get pens that you know you won't be able to find elsewhere, like vintage stuff and pen parts and things like that, that is definitely an advantage of going to a show. Um, if you're trying to just buy like a new thing that you can get online at my store or elsewhere, you know, then it's, it's, if that alone is your reason for going, you know, you might get to hold things and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I don't know if that would be necessarily, that alone would be worth it. But, you know, my recommendation to you um, would be to, you know, if you want to save up some money, sure, you can definitely do that. Certainly give yourself a budget because you could go overboard and kind of go in there with a plan of maybe what you're looking for. Um, and if you don't know, you know, you can certainly look like the Fountain Pen Network would be a tremendous resource for you to start looking of like people that have been to the shows before. Just look up Columbus Pen Show in the search on the Fountain Pen Network. And I'm sure you'll find like past threads where people have like taken pictures of what's at the show, kind of what you can expect. You know, you can even start your own thread on the Fountain Pen Network, kind of asking the same question you've just asked me here. And then people will be more than happy to give you some feedback about stuff that you should look for. And um, what would be kind of cool too is to get, for you to get a feel for like who might be there, and you know, even in, in you know, that, that part of the cool thing about like this whole like social media thing is you can you can like start a meet up there. You could uh, post on Fountain Pen Network and say, hey, I'm kind of new into pens, but I'm planning on bringing this and this and this and this. Who wants to meet up with me for lunch at the show? And we can trade pens and talk pens and that kind of thing. That's the, really the cool aspect of the shows is getting to meet other people, talk to people. So if you can kind of set that stuff up ahead of time, that's where you can really go and, and get a lot out of a pen show as opposed to just kind of showing up and not really knowing what's going on. However, 
that's what I did in 2009 when I went to the DC show. I didn't know anything about pens. I just heard about this show. I wasn't on the fountain pen network. I didn't know anything about fountain pens. I just heard about it through a friend. We went together and it just like, you know, blew my mind that people were into this stuff and it kind of got things rolling for me in the pen world. Um, so that was kind of my experience there. So there's definitely something to be said for like just showing up and seeing what it's like. Um, I think, I think for you, it would probably be a pretty cool experience, honestly. So I would say, yeah, you should probably consider doing it. All right, Tristan N on Facebook. So you just bought yourself a new pen. Walk us through your steps. Do you admire the packaging? Give the pen a quick sniff? Do you flush it first? Fill it up entirely or just dip the nib first? And lastly, how do you decide on your color? I only have 40 colors and I have a hard time choosing. I can imagine this is even harder for you. So I'm very curious on your thought process on this matter. This is really cool and kind of interesting. Um, you know, I, my, my process is probably very different from what most people have. Um, you know, being that I'm a retailer, being that, you know, sometimes I'm able to get my hands on like a pre-production pre sample ahead of time. Not usually, but sometimes I'm able to do that. Um, you know, I may, I may, you know, get uh, kind of like the full range of colors. You know, not every pen are we always buying the full range of colors, but usually that's kind of how we like to do things here at Goulet. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. And, and like oftentimes for me, there, there'll be some times where I'll get a pen in like, you know, um, a Lamy gift set, right? Like that, I don't need to get a sample ahead of time. Like I know that's a product that I want to carry. So I'll just order them and I'll just kind of guess as to how many people are going to want. And, uh, and that's cool. So when I get it in, then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm trying to see like, okay, like what is this box like? And I'm trying to like, I usually have the lens for this type of thing. I usually have the lens on where it's like, okay, I know I'm not going to buy myself a gift set. I've got converters and ink and all this kind of stuff, but this would be great for somebody just getting into the hobby. So I'm thinking of it in terms of, okay, who's going to be the kind of person that would want to buy this thing and what do they care about? That's what I'm looking at when I'm getting a product like this for the first time. You know, something else like the Delta here, you know, this is a pen that I had influence in actually developing. You know, um, when I had my trip out to, to you know, Yaffa in California uh, and I shot that video, interviewed Yair and, and all that, that was super cool. You know, that this is part of, this is, a, this is a, a result that came of that meeting was they were throwing out ideas, we were throwing out ideas, hey, could we get this? Oh man, what if we did that? What if we made it, oh, what if we had the nib was brushed gold, could we do that? A lot of back and forth like that. That was a really fun part of that trip. Um, you know, so being able to kind of influence design and stuff like then when I get a product in, obviously it's, it's a very different kind of thing versus like something that came out that I had no influence in doing. Um, but, but, you know, if you're talking like just, just in general, like there's definitely some pens where it's like, okay, I know we're going to want this pen we'll get it in. Um, but, um, that's that's kind of like the Lamy gift set situation. But um, oftentimes when I'm buying a pen for the first time here, you know, sometimes I'll buy, like I've got pen cases, you know, lined up back here. And a lot of them will be pens that I don't actually carry here. And uh, a lot of times, especially if it's a brand or a model or whatever that I'm not familiar with that I think could be good, but it's really kind of borderline. Um, you know, I just don't know if it's going to kind of live up to what I hope it will be. I'll buy one ahead of time and I'll try it out and kind of use it for a while and kind of put it through the ringer myself. Um, and that's when I'll kind of make a determination like, is this a pen that, that is worth carrying? or not? Do I think I could sell it? You know, is it a good value? You know, there's a lot of kind of criteria that I've got um, for what would be good. Um, but, you know, for, for your typical kind of pen, you know, um, if you've seen any of my, my pen reviews, um, you know, I have kind of a formula, I guess, for the way that I kind of present that. And that's not that different from what I do um, when, I'm, when I'm going through the pen, you know. I get it in and I look at the outer packaging and I kind of see like, oh, that's neat. You know, even if it's a pen that I'm already familiar with and I've gotten a sample of it or something like that, often the packaging is something that hasn't been finalized or, you know, the, the outer sleeve I may have never seen before. So I'm always kind of looking at that and I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. That's embossed or that's, you know, oh, that's cool why they chose to do that. Or, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of inspecting that and just kind of pointing out neat things there and looking at the barcode and kind of seeing how things are labeled. Of course, you know, here, 
here uh, for the retailing side of things, we've got like stuff that we need to do logistically based on how things are named and barcoded and product codes and stuff like that. That's certainly a consideration. You know, I open it up and then I kind of pull it out and looking at the box, you know, kind of feeling the weight and inspecting the quality and all that kind of stuff. Opening it up, I'm kind of looking at the presentation, you know, I'm looking, I'm like, oh yeah, cool, okay, I haven't, I haven't done a lot with Delta pens in the past, I've done some, but this box is different than anything I've seen on their Delta stuff, you know, so I'm looking at it and, um, you know, I'm kind of inspecting, uh, you know, the insert here and, you know, just kind of looking at it and I kind of like build myself into the pen. I'm, re I'm really looking at the whole package, you know, before I get into the pen. I like to experience kind of all of it. You know, that's really all part of it for me. I usually don't care much about the packaging and stuff after the fact, because I know for me, like I've got bins of pen boxes just kind of sitting tucked away there. Um, I don't store all my pens in their boxes unless it's like a special edition kind of thing. Um, but for me, I kind of inspect it and I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like this is, you know, this, this box definitely like makes me feel like I'm getting my money's worth with this pen. It's silly that that's the case, but that certainly is, <laughs> that's the case, that's a pun. Um, but that's definitely what goes, kind of goes through my mind. I'm looking at like all the parts and accessories, like, oh, it comes with a converter. Oh, the converter is in plastic. Okay. Um, you know, does it come with any cartridges or anything like that? So I'm inspecting for that kind of thing. And then I get to the pen, like once I kind of get through all that, I'm like, oh, okay, I got the pen. And I, I definitely like, you know, especially if it's a, if it's a new material like this, like a celluloid, you know, if it's, if it's a typical, like, you know, acrylic acetate kind of plastic, then I'm not like smelling it and all that kind of stuff. Just because I've handled so many of those pens, I'm really just kind of looking at it and feeling it in the shape and all that. But a pen like this, you know, this is a celluloid, so I'll kind of smell it because I don't have a lot of celluloid pens myself. So I'll kind of feel it and it, you know, feels just ever so differently than a normal pen. I'm looking at the engraving and kind of all the details and I'm just kind of seeing like, and I've got, you know, I've got kind of a manufacturing background. That's, I was turning pens when I got into the Goulet Pen Company. So for me, I'm like looking at the shape and I'm looking at, you know, how it's rounded over here. And in my mind, what's going through is like, oh, I know I can, I can envision like somebody like with sandpaper kind of while it's on the lathe, kind of smoothing that out. And like, oh, I wonder what grit sandpaper they use. And I wonder how they smooth that out and how do they polish that and I'm looking at the the polishing marks and I'm looking I'm like oh man they really like they really highly polish that that's a really nice job you know so like I actually go that granular when I'm inspecting a pen for the first time because I've just you know I've got so much knowledge and I've handled so many pens and I have the kind of some of the manufacturing understanding uh, to, to, to a degree. So I'm really looking at all that stuff and I'm looking at the clip and I you know, kind of feel in the spring a little bit looking at a center band and just kind of those aesthetic aspects. You know, open up the pen, looking at it, seeing the nib, the engraving, kind of checking out the feed, always open up the pen. I, I'm a fiddler, you know, so if it can be a disassembled, I'll usually disassemble it. I check and, you know, oh, it's got a little cartridge in here and it's got a black cartridge and okay, cool, yeah, neat. And it's like, oh, the cartridge is turned around backwards. Okay, well, that makes sense, you know, because you don't want it to puncture and stuff like that. And I'm just kind of like inspecting all the different parts. You know, and for me, when I'm handling a pen for the first time, usually everything that's going through my mind is, you know, if it's, if it's a pen that um, we're not yet carrying on the site, for me, what's going through my mind is, okay, is this a pen that's gonna be worth carrying? Is this something that people would be interested in? Who would this pen be for? You know, um, is this is a quality holding up? Is it a good value? You know, kind of where is this pen falling? Who would this appeal to? So that's the kind of stuff that's running through my head in addition to all these other things. So it's like, a, you know, I got layers of stuff that's going through my mind. Um, that's why, like, it's, it's funny because like, you know, if I, get a, if I get a pen and you can, you know, you could ask, you know, not practically, but if you if you asked anyone around here, kind of like, what is it? What does Brian look like when he's inspecting a pen for the first time? I'm like, I'm like in the zone, you know, and I'm like really kind of getting into it. And I'm like, huh, kind of talking. It's like, oh, that's interesting, you know. And you know, I'm holding the pen and I'm like, oh, okay, what are these threads like? How thick are these threads? Are they kind of shallow? Are they sharp on my fingers? You know, where does my thumb fall? What's the step like? How's that gonna be for people? How far back is the step? You know, is that something that people with smaller hands are gonna have more of an issue? Like, I'm always got a lens on with new products, like how would this, how would this sell? Would this be popular? How would this hold up over time? Would people like it? Does it kind of fit as an L-value alignment? Is it gonna fit in with my company, my brand? Uh, but also what's going through my mind is, you know, 
okay, if I'm gonna talk about this pen, shoot it in a video, taking pictures and so on, what are the things that are that make this pen cool? What's different about it? What's what's kind of magical, you know? And, and that's kind of what's going through my mind. What makes it different? What's the engraving on the nib, you know? What's that like? You know, that's, so, so that's really what's going through. And that's before I even ink up the pen and write with it. It's all, it's all to that degree, you know? And then once I do that, you know, you ask me about like, do I flush the nib? Um, <laughs> This is one of those things where it's like, I definitely don't practice what I preach all the time. Um, if it's a pen that, you know, I'm really excited to use, honestly, most of the time I don't flush the nib. I don't clean it. I don't do anything. I just ink it up and go. Like, I'm so excited to just try it for the first time that I often don't do that. And then it's like, if I have flow issues or if it's not writing like I expect, then I'll clean it out. You know, I know I'm gonna be using the pen for a while, cleaning it out and stuff like that. So I don't sweat it too much unless I know it's gonna be, you know, possibly an issue, then I'll clean it out. Or if it's something like a new pen that it's like, I really wanna, you know, if, if it's a pen that I anticipate, I will really need to, to have kind of like, um, you know, kind of a, an unbiased opinion on it or whatever, I might clean it out just so I know like the first time I'm inking it up uh, that I'm getting like the true impression of what it should be. But, you know, I'll go ahead and say like as a disclaimer, it's always a good idea to clean out your new pens um, just because, you know, there's manufacturing oils and little pieces of debris and that kind of potential for stuff, um, you know, that could, that could always be in there that, you know, you want to make sure your pen is flowing well. Me personally, in practicality, what I end up doing is I usually ink up the pen and if there are any flow issues or if it's not writing like I would expect it to write, then I will clean it out and kind of inspect it and take it apart and that kind of thing and and uh, diagnose it a little bit further at that point. But I'm usually just too dang excited to uh, ink it up. Then what I do is I've got like rhodia pads and stuff like that. I'm not gonna go through the whole routine of what I do here just cause I'm already taking up a lot of time but um, on this question, but um, you know, I will ink it up and write with it and I'll, you know, try a couple different kinds of paper just to see how it feels. Um, but my baseline is rhodia 80 gram paper. That's like my, that's my deal. You know, I use it all the time. I got several different notebooks with that rhodia paper. And so I'm, I always got a notebook handy. I can just kind of grab and go. Uh, and I'm very familiar with that paper. So it's like, you know, it becomes my standard. Um, and a lot of times too, you know, what happens with me is I'll use it for a little while and then I'll, um, if it's a new pen like this one, the Unica, um, you know, I'm gonna do a nib nook writing sample with that. So I become familiarize myself with the pen a little bit, ink it up, make sure it's good. Noodler's Black is my nib nook ink that I use. Um, so I will ink it up with Noodler's Black, write with it a bit, and then I've got Rhodia paper, Noodler's Black, very consistent, and I can kind of see like how the nib feels. Um, you know, this one, I know that the nib is going to be the same, um, in terms of its writability as a Delta Serena, because I, you know, talked to the, the Delta folks about that. So this one, I, I would actually have, uh, an understanding of what, it, how it should write by the time I ink it up for the first time. And so, um, I will know that and I'll be comparing it to the, what I remember the Serena writing like. Um, so that, you know, that's, it's that kind of thing. So um, then cleaning it out and so on, you know, this is a cartridge converter pen. So cleaning it out is, you know, typical kind of deal. There's not a lot I'm learning at that point. Um, but you know, that's kind of my routine. So, you know, it's, it's definitely probably more stuff than you would typically think about um, because I've got the, all the elements of, you know, not only enjoying the pen for myself, but you know, I have, a lot of pens already. So for me, it's not always just, you know, this is another pen I need for my collection. For me, a lot of times it's, okay, this is a pen that I'm gonna try to learn as much about as I can so that I can talk about it and really get it across to you in a video as well as I can. I've got that kind of element going on. So I'm really kind of trying to learn as much as possible. And for me, when I get a new pen like this, I may spend a good, you know, two or three hours kind of playing around with it, researching, you know, just making sure that all my, my, my um, information's kind of buttoned up um, before I'm, I'm really getting into it um, and making sure that I kind of learn and know that pen uh, as well as I can. So, uh, and then, you know, kind of last thing you asked is like, you know, as far as choosing colors, oh gosh. Um, you know, for me, like my colors end up being kind of a hodgepodge. I actually don't have as much of a preference for color for pens as I do for ink, believe it or not. Um, I definitely have a propensity towards blue ink, you know, that kind of Liberty's Elysium 
pro, you know, uh, Eroshizuku Kampeki kind of range of blues. I've got Diamond Aza blue and just like all these, all these like mid-range blues. It's just, I'm naturally drawn to that. But for pens though, I'm much more exploratory. You know, I usually kind of look at the range, you know, I've got the advantage there for sure of being a retailer. So I know if I want a particular pen, I'm gonna get to see every color pen. You know, the OG was coming out in three pen, three colors. I'm gonna be able to look at all three and see, hmm, which one do I like? Let me look at it in different light. Let me kind of see which one really strikes me. I get to spend a little time with them. Oh, you know, I think I'm gonna like this green the best. So this is the one that I'm gonna keep. You know, it'll be that kind of thing. Um, but definitely there's certain other ones like this orange. I was like, yeah, if we got the chance to use this orange, dude, totally, let's do that. Um, but uh, it's, it's much more, um, kind of in looking at kind of my whole collection, seeing like, oh, this is a unique color. I don't have a pen that's this color. You know, like I typically am not that much into yellow, but you know, if I get a, a chance to get a bright, like this regatta sport, like, I don't know why, but like this yellow just like, bam, like kind of punches me in the face. And it's like, that's cool. Like, I just want that. I want that color combination, that kind of bumblebee look. I don't know, I don't have anything like that. So then I'll go for that. But you know, I don't, I, this is probably like one of the only yellow pens I have, except for something like a Safari, where I might just kind of collect one of every color. Um, but it's really much more about kind of like what's missing in my collection and what's unique in that that model, you know, if there's three or five colors coming out, what really stands out within that line? And I'll kind of go for that for my personal one. So it's kind of a neat, neat combination of balancing out what's already in my collection and what strikes me in the moment. All right, next question. Chris P on Facebook. I just got the Noodler's Art Nib set as a gift. They're pretty fun, but I'm wondering, is it worth trying to smooth non-tipped nibs? And are there any great tips from the artists on Team Goulet on how best to use these nibs, techniques, papers, etc.? Um, well, the first thing I would say is these nibs are cheap, so you could do whatever the heck you want with them. If you want to smooth them, go for it, man. It's a set of three nibs for six bucks. Like, don't sweat it too much. Even the, the tipped ones, you know, the Noodler's ones, they're two bucks. You know, it's like, do whatever you want. Um, but as far as um, smoothing an untipped nib. So basically what that means is you've got a fountain pen nib, which is going to be made of stainless steel or gold. You know, there's titanium, there's a couple other things, but you know, pretty much stainless steel and gold. That's what the nib itself, the whole thing is made of. But the very, very tip has a small amount of a very hard metal, some kind of iridium alloy or something like that, something that's harder than stainless steel that is gonna be on the very tip because that's what's actually touching the paper. That's what's making the friction, the contact, and, and it's not going to wear away as quickly as stainless steel or certainly gold. Gold would wear away very quickly. Um, but if you have an untipped nib, it's almost always gonna be stainless steel. Um, and it's going, to, um, it's going to wear away quicker than uh, a tipped nib would. So if you are looking to smooth an untipped nib, you can do it, but you gotta go really light because you can overdo it much quicker than you can with a normal nib that's tipped, okay? Um, so that kind of covers that. And then how, how best to use the artist nibs? I'll be completely honest. I personally have not had the time to mess around too much with those nibs. Um, I want to, but I just have not been able to. Um, uh, however, many of my customer care team has, and they've been messing around with them and having a lot of fun. They really enjoy them. Um, I haven't been able to sit down with them and see like in full detail. And I know you asked this question last week, even I'm pulling this question from last week. And I just, I don't have the best answer for you right now. Uh, however, I will say that with a product that's this cheap, um, it's the kind of thing you just get it and mess around with it. Like, I'm not trying to push it. Like, don't, don't buy it if you don't have six bucks. But you know, if you do and you're interested in it at all, just get it and do it. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, and then, you know, I would love to hear what you think about it. But my customer care team has been messing around with it, having a good time. They've been surprised at the quality of the nibs for the price. So that's kind of cool. Um, so yeah, that's about all I can cover on that one. Um, Jordan L on Facebook said, I like the Namiki Pilot Falcon, same thing, name change, um, and the idea of it being great for flex, assuming I don't want to go vintage, is awesome. But I would be afraid of how much you can actually flex it without worrying about springing it. How far exactly will the Falcon flex comfortably? 
Thanks. Well, Jordan, this is a good question um, and one that I like to talk about because I think a, too many people overdo it with this pen. Um, there are some videos out there um, that have kind of, kind of gone viral using the, the Falcon. Um, the one in particular um, uses a modified Falcon, a Falcon that has additional flex and has ground to a finer nib. So for those who don't understand that, they think that seeing that video that if they buy a Falcon, they should be able to do the same thing as what's done in that video, not realizing that pen has been modified. So if you're using just a stock you know, Falcon, you can still get some line variation out of it, a pretty decent amount. But if you're trying to really push the limits, it's definitely possible for you to spring that, that nib. Um, and it happens more often than I would like. Um, we try to educate, we try to, to do as much of that stuff as possible, but there's a certain percentage of Falcons that we know that we sell that are gonna come back to us with ruined nibs. Um, and we try to work through that as much as we can. And that just kind of, you know, it is what it is. Um, so uh, as far as uh, how much you can flex it, oh boy, this is a tough one because, you know, I would say it's not gonna go wider than, uh, I haven't really done any specific measurements or anything like that. Maybe it would be good if I did that someday. Um, but I would say, you know, and it's gonna depend too on which nib you're actually using, like the tip, but it's, it's usually, I would say, probably like a millimeter to a millimeter and a half of width before you wanna kinda of ease up on it. It's a kind of thing, like if you're using it, you can tell, like definitely if you're railroading and that kind of thing, you're, you're kind of going too wide. Um, but if it's, if it's, um, if you're, this is such a touchy, this is such a touchy one. I'm having a hard time very explaining it just in, in, um, in words. And I've definitely thought about like, could I do a video on like how to ruin your Falcon or like when it's gone too far? You know, but it's, it's not enough people have done it where it's worth me like freaking people out about it. It's definitely like something you want to watch out because it's, it's an expensive pen, you know, so you want to be careful with it. But I would say just go easy on it. You know, I don't know if there's like a specific measurement or something I can give you to do that. But I would say just be cautious and just use your best judgment. You know, don't, as long as you're not getting the pen and just really like, oh, let me see how wide I can go. You know, as long as you're not going crazy. Um, you know, if you get railroading, don't think like, oh, if I just press harder, it'll get the ink to flow. You know, like don't do that kind of thing. That's probably, honestly, using your own gut, your own intuition is probably your best bet. Just with the understanding that, you know, this pen is not called a flex pen. It's a soft nib. That's how they advertise it. It's soft. So you can get line variation. It's very springy. But if you're, if you're flexing that thing out to the max every day, you're gonna ruin that nib over time. So I would just be careful with it. You know, just use your best judgment. That's probably the best way for me to say it. Oh man, my throat is like, I really need some water. Sorry, forgive me here. I normally shoot these Q and A's in the morning when my voice is all fresh. I've been talking a lot today. And I'm kind of like losing it here a little bit towards the end. So it's like late afternoon as I'm shooting this here on Wednesday. So um, next question I have is from um, Bruce S on Facebook. Question's a little bit long, but it's interesting. So bear with me for a minute, okay? Uh, Bruce says, I've been watching your videos and have been in the fountain pens for about a year now. And one question that always comes to mind when looking at fountain pen stores, brick and mortar and online in the US is the limited nib grinds. It seems like a pen enthusiast would need to go to another country, i.e. Japan, or through a nibmeister to get some of these grinds. I'm at the stage where I have a good feeling of the pen shape, but interested in exploring grinds of pens. I totally feel ya. What's the best way to go about experiencing these nib styles not available in the US? Posting, wave, music, course, etc. As a retailer and a fellow enthusiast, do you see a need or a move to get more of these into the US? So this is a great question, um, especially like you look at companies, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty much Japanese. Um, like Sailor has a ton of these crazy looking nibs um, and Pilot has a really good selection of different nib grinds too. 
Um, the European nibs, not so much. They tend to be pretty straightforward. They'll have some metallics. They'll have more obliques and stuff in the European nibs. The Japanese ones are the ones where you really get some interesting nibs because of the Japanese language, you know, writing in characters and stuff. Um, it just, it, it warrants more like uh, variation in the line width and, and flow and stuff like that. That's why they have all these interesting nibs. Um, so for me, like I, I totally feel you, Bruce. Like I am right there with you. I, I would love to see like, what the heck is a posting nib? What is an FA nib that Pilot has? You know, what are all these interesting things? And I'm I'm like pushing for these and I don't, I don't know any more than you do, honestly, because these are pens that I don't have access to any more than you. Um, so I'm, I'm at the point now where like I've been building up relationships with some of these, you know, Sailor, I don't have a relationship with them right now. So I can't really speak to their nibs at all. Uh, Pilot is a different story. You know, Pilot, um, you know, I've got, I've got a little more influence now with Pilot and what kind of stuff comes into the US than I did when I first started out in this business. Um, and so I am trying to explore more of what these different nibs are. You know, I'm, I'm telling Pilot things like, you know, the soft nibs, the flex nibs, like that people like that kind of stuff. People like italics, that's really popular, more so than you may realize. So I'm like really trying to advocate for like, yeah, people wanna explore these nibs. But, you know, it's tough. It's a tough balance because when you think about, you know, these these non-traditional nib sizes, right? Like, um, you know, the the kind of the ones, some of the ones you called out. Um, uh, it's interesting because, you know, not a lot of people are as familiar with them. So it's hard to gauge what the demand for them might be uh, if people don't know about it, you know? And so it's, it's always kind of tough. Um, uh, what would be really kind of neat for me would be to get my hands on some of these nibs, be able to kind of show you what they're like, you know, and that's kind of thing like, I guess I could always just like go buy them from an overseas retailer. That would, that would probably make sense for me to do that. Um, you know, but for me, <laughs> Kind of the reason I wouldn't want to do that, you know, flipping on like a different hat here. The reason I wouldn't want to go like, you know, showing you like all these other kind of nibs is like, I know it would just be frustrating to show you a nib that you can't get, you know, or not can't get easily. And then it's like, you know, I'm, I'm going through and like showing you stuff that I can't offer you. And that would be frustrating uh, for you and for me. So, you know, it's kind of tough. So I haven't, I haven't really explored a lot of those nibs that are really kind of like Japanese only. Um, and there's logistics behind maybe why they're not offered in the US. Part of it might be based on demand or perceived demand. Um, part of it might just be a cultural difference. Like, you know, in the US, we don't understand why a nib would be made that way. So we just don't, you know, don't want to learn about it, um, you know, from like a distribution standpoint. Um, and part of it could just be the manufacturing. Like it's just to make some of these nibs, the reason like nib meisters and stuff might be the only ones you have some of these crazy nibs is because of the craftsmanship, the work that's involved to make them isn't something that makes sense to kind of mass produce, if you will. Um, and so it's not something that could be widely distributed. So it is kind of obscure and hard to find these certain nibs because there's only one or two people in the world that might be able to actually grind them that way. You know, that is probably more the case than anything. Um, so it would be interesting to explore. I know uh, in particular, you know, it's no secret now, uh, the cat's out of the bag with the pilots coming out with the, the custom 912 here in the US. And we actually were able to weigh in on which nibs were able to come into the US. Um, we had to kind of pick and choose and it was kind of tough based on you know, some of the limited understanding we had of what some of the nibs were. But, you know, when they asked our opinion, we said, oh, we're gonna give it to them. You know, so pens like the postable nib or the, the it's called the postal, posting nib, postal, postal nib, I think is what it's called. Um, the FA nib, the music nib, the, um, What's it called? The C nib, which I think is that course maybe. I don't know. I'm still learning them myself. Um, but those are going to be coming into the U.S. in December. So those will be really interesting to learn about, you know. Um, so I'll be exploring that kind of right along with you. Um, so that'll be really neat. But I, I think that that might be kind of like a foot in the door, that custom 912. It might be a foot in the door to kind of exploring some of these, you know, unconventional nib types. Um, and if, it, if, if they sell well, you know, because that's, that's part of what would show where the, where the demand is, not just people talking about it, but people actually buying them, 
If they sell really well, I'm willing to bet that we will have a little more weight, a little more kind of power behind us to say, hey, you know, people really like this FA nib. We could offer this on another pen or we could, you know, explore some other nib types that are coming in, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it'll be really interesting to see what happens with that pen in particular. All right, next question here. Doing okay. Okay, I guess I'm doing okay on time. Uh, Henry on Ink Nouveau said, is there a difference between a woman using a fountain pen versus a man? Any difference in writing line thickness, ink pen, or nib selection? Try comparing Brian's, mine, with uh, writing with Rachel's. Um, so this is an interesting question, Henry. I, 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 I don't think I've ever explored this too much, like specifically like this. Uh, let me kind of like make a blanket statement here that I don't think that gender in and of itself makes a difference. Um, I've seen so many different ways that people write, um, you know, even just with my own staff here, just kind of seeing the way that people hold their pens, the, the, the speed they write, and just, excuse me, the hand size and all that kind of thing. Like, I think there's general assumptions that you could make based on gender, you know, with the fact that statistically men will probably have bigger hands than women. That's probably about the only assumption that you could really make um, that would affect pen selection, um, other than maybe aesthetic preferences, but even that would be kind of a, uh, an assumption. Um, but that's really about it. And so I, I think there's so many other variables at play that I wouldn't, I wouldn't wanna make a broad statement to say, this pen is better for men, this pen is better for women. What I usually tend to say is this pen is better for people with larger hands, this pen is better for people with smaller hands, you know, because everybody's different. Um, but even still, like some of the variables, okay, so I guess if I break it down like that, like, you know, men versus women, let me just say like the gender thing probably doesn't matter as much. Let me call it bigger hands and smaller hands because I think that is more of a factor um, in specifically in how the pen writes. You know, certainly there's a preference for the weight and the size, length of pen, you know, um, balance and stuff like that. And that could be influenced by your hand size. Um, so for example, a pen like the Ojiva here, it's a longer pen, it's a bigger pen. So somebody with a bigger hand would probably have more of a preference for it, you know, than somebody with a smaller hand. That's an assumption. You know, of course you could write with it unposted and then it it's changes the game there. So even that would post it unposted, that's a factor. Um, but I would say in general, probably the assumption that could be made is people with bigger hands could have more of a propensity to hold their pen at a lower writing angle. That's an assumption, but me personally, like, let me not mean speak that broadly, okay? Because I'm just, I'm making all kinds of assumptions. Let me just talk me and Rachel, okay? I hold my pens at a lower writing angle than Rachel does. So that right there means that I generally am gonna have a thicker, darker line than Rachel will. She holds her pen much more upright, just naturally, than I do. She also has a four finger grip, I have a three finger grip. So that in and of itself drastically changes the writing angle. She does this kind of thing, I can't even like, I can't even do exactly what she does, and I make fun of her for it all the time. Um, but uh, she's got this kind of four finger grip that, that makes her pen kind of sit more resting in kind of the, the second knuckle here, I guess, whatever knuckle you call this of her forefinger. Um, so it's, it's much more upright. Me personally, I have a three finger grip. My pen's dropped way down, like below 45 degrees. Um, I have a very large hand, long fingers, and I have a very relaxed kind of grip. So I am, my pen angle's really low. Um, I also have a very heavy hand. So uh, like physically I have a heavy hand, but I also write with a decent amount of pressure. So like that combination of lower pen angle, more pressure, my lines look a lot darker, a lot wetter than Rachel's do. Same pen, same ink paper, everything. Literally you look at a pen where she's writing and I'm writing and it looks, it almost looks like a different ink and a different pen like nib size was used because it looks that drastically different. So that probably that pen angle and writing pressure are probably the biggest factors right there. Whether you can attribute that to gender is probably just bunk, I don't know. But in general, I would say the bigger hand you have, then, uh, I don't know. That would be an interesting experiment actually to see if the bigger hand you have, if the the broader the line you write and the, the wetter or the darker your ink line looks. 
I would just I, I would say that that you you could probably throw that assumption out there to be made maybe I don't know I'm really just hypothesizing here completely speaking out of my butt so uh, anyway <laughs> I don't know why I just said that. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, so that's that's kind of what I would say I could attribute kind of to your question there, Henry. Whether or not you find anything valuable out of what I just said, uh, you know, we'll just kind of go with that. Um, Next question I have uh, is from Donna M. on Facebook. I vividly remember the first time I ever saw a fountain pen in action at age five. How did your love affair with fountain pens begin? Oh boy, uh, this is a long story that I'll try to abbreviate. I've talked about this at length in, in lots of other videos and stuff before. Um, I, had, I grew up with no experience with fountain pens whatsoever. I was vaguely kind of familiar with how they worked, but really mine kind of started with um, when I was making pens. You know, I was turning pens, making them out of wood. I'm looking around on my desk to see if I have any ones that I can show you real quick. Oh, which I should. I just happen to have all my pen cases open here. Okay, so. I have, you know, a pen that I made here out of wood. One of the very few rare half decent ones that I have because anything that was half decent I sold because I was starving at the time. Um, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't make myself like a bunch of nice pens to keep. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so I was making pens like this out of wood. They almost always had metal grip sections like this. And this is a fountain pen, but you could just as easily unscrew this and you can convert it into a rollerball. So I was making rollerball pens, but you could buy these kind of metal parts where you buy them in kits um, and you could buy fountain pen kits like I have right here. So it comes with the grip, you know, the fountain pen nib and the converter and all that kind of stuff. So you could just make, I would actually make the same pen and I could just swap out a fountain pen for a rollerball. So this was actually my first introduction to a fountain pen at all, was my own pens that I was making. I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know what the heck was going on. I didn't know how to fill them. I didn't know how they worked. I didn't know anything until I went to that fountain pen show in Washington DC for the first time um, back in 2009. So I went to that show thinking like, gee, I'm having a hard time selling my rollerball pens. Maybe I could make fountain pens, you know, swap out the grip, make fountain pens. And, and, and so I went to that show. I was like, let me try and pick up some Rhodia because I've heard that Rhodia is good paper. I didn't know anything about it at the time. Let me get a bottle of ink. I didn't have a bottle of ink at the time. I was that ignorant. So I went to that show, bought a bottle of ink, bought a Rhodia pad. That was kind of my first experience with using a fountain pen. I spilled my bottle of ink the first time I filled it. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Um, you know, I just didn't know anything. And so um, I had to learn it. So I went online to the Fountain Pen Network and started searching on blogs and finding other people that were kind of into this thing. The information was, was there, but it was very scattered. Um, Fountain Pen Network had been around for a while at that point. I think it had around 45,000 members at the time. Now I think it's over 80,000. It's grown a lot in the last five years. Um, but at the time, you know, the information was there and it was good, but it wasn't it wasn't all assembled really well, you know? And the way that forums work, as you know, probably, is, you know, you have threads that come up, but then the information kind of dies off after the conversation dies. And, you know, if you're doing Google searches and stuff, you can find kind of older threads where there's really good information, but it's, it's sometimes hard to find exactly the information you're looking for. So I was on Fountain Pen Network very active for the first several years that I was in, in uh, kind of learning about fountain pens. But then as I got more into pens and I started carrying ink and paper and some of the stuff to go along with it, um, it that was really it. So I actually, I learned about fountain pens, but I really wasn't that knowledgeable about fountain pens really for that first whole year that I, after I had some experience with them, you know, I. My original idea with my business was I was going to make my own fountain pens like this out of wood because I'd spent three years building up a huge uh, amount of experience crafting this wood on pens. Turns out people don't really want these, but that was my problem back then. Um, so I, I thought I'll just make a fountain pen version, whatever, who cares, and I'll carry the ink and paper of these brand names, get people to my site, become known as a craftsman, and I'll be this big, you know, master craftsman for the rest of my life. That was my original vision. Didn't pan out that way, and that's okay, because things have worked out okay. But anyway, that led me into learning about fountain pens and you know, I learned, you know, I kind of alluded to like, why didn't the fountain pens really work? Okay, well, it's because 
all the grips are metal. Like all the grips for these wood pens, they're all metal and slick. And it's like, okay, and they're really thin too. Cause you know, you got this huge thick cap with wood and there's a brass barrel under here that you have to glue into the wood before you turn it. And so it's all very thick, very heavy pens with these really thin, slick metal grip sections. So like I have big hands and I'm using these things and I'm like, oh man. And the caps are extremely heavy. So you try to post it, it's really long. It's extremely back heavy with this thin grip that's really slick and this tiny nib. And it's like, oh, you know, it's just, you know, it's just not that, not that great. And then with the kit pens, you know, you're spending a lot of money as a manufacturer, you're spending a lot of money on these kits with these exotic woods, you're spending a lot of time. So the pen itself ends up costing what you would pay for, you know, a vanishing point or, you know, a Namiki Falcon, like that kind of thing. But it has this like really not great stainless steel nib that comes on the kit. So unless you're swapping out these nibs, you know, the, the, the writing experience is kind of meh, you know? So that was the feedback I got as soon as I got into trying to sell these nice pens was people really didn't like the weight and the way they wrote and they didn't like the way that the nib felt and I didn't know anything about nib sizes and grinds or any of that kind of stuff. I was completely ignorant. I knew how to make pens out of wood. I knew how to turn pens. But so I was, there was a whole other world that I just didn't understand and that's when I started to dive deep into the forums and blogs and stuff. And as I did that, I was like, oh, okay, there's a lot of other things going on here besides let me just make a pretty pen and slap a fountain pen nib on it, which is essentially what I thought at the beginning I could do. As I learned more about it, I was like, oh man, there's just so much more to it than what I realized. And so that's when I started exploring the ink and paper side of things. I kind of like, I had a lot of love loss, you know, because I really poured my heart and soul into making these wood pens. And, you know, it just, my, I was really passionate about it and I wasn't able to make it work. And that aspect of the business kind of died off. And my vision, this dream I had of being a master craftsman kind of died away with that. And I really kind of mourned that loss for, for like the first year that I was in the, in the fountain pen business. So really at that time, everything was focused on ink and paper. That was like, for me, the ink has always been like the draw for fountain pens, no pun intended. Uh, it's the colors, the flow, the properties, all that, the shading, all that. Like I totally just go nuts over that. And so that was really kind of the initial love that I had for fountain pens. For me, the fountain pen was just kind of like the vehicle. It was like, okay, like I didn't understand the feel, the weight, the, all that. I didn't, I didn't have like a very like attuned kind of experience with fountain pens. So for me, the type of pen and all that, like didn't really matter as much. Um, it was more about the ink and just like, how the ink popped and the paper, the feel and the paper and all that. So that's really kind of where I got my appreciation to begin with. That's where my love affair really started started with fountain pens. It was really kind of the fountain pens were an afterthought for me. And it was the ink and the paper that was my love. Um, then once I got a lot more experience, I started to get kind of the bug for fountain pens. I started to kind of understand the appeal and really kind of hone my own kind of feeling uh, for them, understanding the weight, the balance and the different nib sizes and stuff like that. You know, I, I learned how to kind of smooth my own nibs and like stuff like that. And then I really kind of understand my, my understanding and depth of knowledge of kind of that whole trifecta, the fountain pen, ink, paper, and how they all kind of, you draw a Venn diagram, they all kind of overlapped into like your writing experience right in the middle there. That really is kind of like it for me. So now I've got like a very well-rounded, like the paper is like, man, I got my papers that I like and I just use them and that's it. Like I don't even use any other kind of junky paper. You know, my inks, I got my favorites, my go-tos. I always love to try new stuff, but you know, I got my good ones. Now it's like the pens, like the pens come out and like that's, you know, now I appreciate so many aspects of the pen itself that I'm really learning and exploring a lot of that as well. So it's, it's kind of neat. That's just, I'm still learning too every day. And that's, that's to me, what's so cool about this whole thing. I have been immersed, deeply immersed in the fountain pen world full time, like times three, you know, cause I'm like, I live and breathe this stuff, uh, all the time for the last five years. And I still, every time I get a new pen in, I'm like, 
like, yo, this is so cool. Like, I still have that same passion like I did when I got my first pen. Like, and, and for me, that's just like, if I can do that within a five year period like this, then I know you as like a normal human being using your fountain pens just as a part of your daily life, you're gonna have a lifetime of enjoyment and learning and experience with these fountain pens. If you know, and for me, like I still love it this much, I know you will too. So that's just kind of cool. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of leave it at that. Um, I'm about my battery's about to die again. That's kind of my reference for when I know I need to, to wrap it up. So my question of the week for this week, I would love to hear in the comments on YouTube or on the blog, um, what was the most embarrassing Halloween costume that you ever wore as a kid? I'm really curious to hear because, you know, Halloween is coming out tomorrow and, you know, I'm not that big into Halloween, but I dressed up a little bit as a kid. Uh, my most embarrassing one was when I was like two or probably three years old. Well, no, that's not my most embarrassing. Okay, well, yeah, no, when I was two years old, uh, I went as a pumpkin. And so my mom, you know, bless her heart, was very creative. She, you know, sewed this big pumpkin costume, but it was filled with diapers. So I was literally wearing a big sack with diapers. It looked like a pumpkin, but I was so embarrassed. Uh, gosh, would I even remember that? I must have been older than two. How would I have possibly remembered that? It was a very early memory, but it's there. Um, I was wearing a big sack full of diapers. That was my most embarrassing Halloween costume. So I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week here. Um, if you uh, have any questions for next week, feel free to leave it in the comments. Uh, look out for the big announcement tomorrow. It's going to be epic. And I hope you have a great week. I already said that, but whatever. I have a bad time wrapping things up. Anyway, right on.